Hello and welcome to our Lakeside Chat. We are David Wofford and Katie Noonan, co-chairs of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. And we're so happy that you can join us tonight. As we begin our program, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are on stolen land, that Lake Merritt is part of Ohlone territory. We hear now from Corinna Gould, spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon and co-founder of Segura Tay Land Trust. Good afternoon, relatives. My name is Karina Gould. I am the spokesperson for the Confederated Villages of Lashon. We are here today at what most folks think of as Lake Merritt. Uh, we are in the territory of Huchin. Huchin is actually a territory that encompasses six Bay Area cities, Oakland, Berkeley, Alameda, Emeryville, Albany, and Piedmont. And so this is a place that my ancestors have been since the beginning of time. And this was a place of abundance. I'm so happy that people from all walks of life that now come into our territory can enjoy this beautiful place that my ancestors have enjoyed since the beginning of time. My relationship to the land, the land that I have been born to, raising my children and grandchildren here, has been to tell the story, the truth, of what happened on this land before other people came here. I'm hoping that as we begin to learn these lessons of fires in California, the pandemic that's happening, that human beings come back to living in reciprocity with the earth. Hank, the female white pelican, has been a resident of Lake Merritt for 16 years. She was transferred to the Rotary Nature Center by the Fish and Wildlife Service as a rescue animal because she cannot fly. Popularized by James Robinson's book, A Bird's Tail, she has become a mascot and an ambassador for wildlife in Lakeside Park. In February, Ms. Lau's and Ms. Fong's classes from Cleveland Elementary School visited the wildlife refuge to learn more about the birds and their environment. The children learned that after 15 years of care by Nature Center naturalists, Hank is no longer being fed by city naturalists in the winter after the rest of her species has taken off on the Pacific Flyway to the wintering grounds. They decided to advocate for Hank by writing letters to the mayor on her behalf. Hi, my name is Lila, and I'm in second grade. My teacher is Miss Lau. My school is Cleveland. We went on a field trip to learn about the food web and watershed. Some kids saw Hank and the white pelican. Hank got injured by flying into a power line. I learned pelicans have four toes. Hey, friend, come. Four months a year only. Poor Hank has no other pelican to help her hunt for food. I want Hank to have a good, healthy life. She only can get a few fish on her own. Please feed Hank. That Hank should be supported right here. Uh, it's such a model for uh, support what people can do for wildlife. Since these um, videos were taken, um, since the students made their um, videos back in 2020, um, Hank has continued to be fed by local um, volunteers during the time when um, he's not accompanied by other pelicans. The white pelicans depend on a group foraging strategy. And so um, we'd like to um, thank those volunteers who've been out there feeding uh, Hank and mention that um, they're um, going to be taking special care of her this year after the 2022 um, August fish kill and subsequent, um, environment, uh, subsequent atmospheric rivers um, have decimated fish populations. We're not sure how quickly they will return. And so um, we want to mention and thank the Oakland Zoo for contributing fish for Hank's upkeep um, until it can be determined, determined that she can take care of herself during the months when pelicans visit the wildlife refuge. So thank you to volunteers and the Oakland Zoo for supporting Hank. May she live out for 30 plus possible years in peace and understanding at Lake Merritt. Thank you. And now, um, any, I'm going to share a few highlights from our month. 
as every month, this has been a really um, wonderful month. As we mentioned, we celebrated Hank's 21st birthday. Um, students came down and watched in awe as she swam close to the shore and received some fish. Um, we also uh, <clears throat> celebrated student achievement by helping students um, complete a GOBE project. And I've invited one of the students to just read some of their um, reflections on that experience of doing water testing and observations at Lake Merritt. Rohan, are you in the room? Okay, so let's hear uh, uh, in the lower uh, left, we have students from the MetWest High School. We were able for the first time to pay for transportation for a field trip for them. And um, Rohan, go ahead and, and read one of their reflections. But yes, uh, the Met West reflection was something we like about water testing is being able to see how the lake is doing, testing what's inside the water and what water color it is. Climate observations and the water testing can help us keep check on the dissolved oxygen in the water and why we need it. Using water testing, we might be able to diagnose how we can fix the water. All right. And um, in the middle, we have uh, new voices are rising. Yes, from new voices, whether it's at Lake Merritt, in my environmental in my environmental science class, or checking my water quality at home, tests like pH and alkalinity are always important to me. It's always interesting to see how small shifts in climate or outside influences can completely change the results of these tests. And uh, finally, our Achieve Scholars. From Achieve. Seeing the interactions between climate and micro and macro organisms has helped us recognize natural connections in the world around us. We enjoy seeing how the weather affects different quality qual water quality markers in Lake Merritt. For example, when we get lots of rainfall, we see differences in the oxygen and acidity of the lake. We enjoyed seeing the lake bounce back from the algae bloom and fish kill from several months ago. We like being able to test the water oxygen levels as well as just being involved with the activity. We always have a spark of energy when it comes to learning how to work with the testing steps. Thank you. So it's been a lot of fun to work with high school students and elementary students, students at the lake with hands-on activities. Uh, this month, we had our first in-person retreat of board members and uh, we met at the uh, historic Cohen Bray, Bray Victorian House in the Fruitvale. Um, as, and um, it was great to get together. We are um, looking for additional board members, especially younger people, um, and envisioning what environmental education can look like at Lake Merritt in the heart of an urban area. And finally, um, we uh, this month, we took the lead in um, bringing together uh, organizations that do environmental education at the lake to um, help sponsor the um, California Academy of Sciences um, City Nature Challenge at Lake Merritt uh, with iNaturalist. And so um, happy to be working alongside all of these organizations. At this point, um, I would like to uh, introduce our featured guests, um, Jim. Costa. And it's such a pleasure to have Jim here. Um, and, uh, you know, there's so much one could say, and we're just so delighted that you're here. Um, let me introduce you with a few words. Um, so Jim Costa is the executive director of the Highlands Biological Station in Highlands, North Carolina, and professor of biology at Western Carolina University in uh, Cullowee, North Carolina, where he has taught courses in genetics, entomology, ge biogeography, and evolution. An entomologist with a special interest in social evolution, Jim has a research associate, has been a research associate in entomology at the Museum of Comparative, Comparative Zoology, I believe at Harvard, uh, since 1996, and author of numerous research papers, reviews, and other books and books, including um, the Other Insect Societies, which is amazing. Um, he's done an annotated origin of species um, and uh, books on uh, Wallace's works as well. And one of my favorites, which is in Darwin's backyard about um, the experiments that Darwin used to do 
on his uh, in the backyard with his children, which seemed to me inspirational for some of the things that um, environmental educators can think about in the future. Um, he has uh, his current uh, book that he's that's just come out is called um, Radical by Nature: um, The Revolutionary Life of um, Alfred Russell Wallace. Um, a wonderful read um, and um, so so much information on every page. It's um, such a delight and I heartily recommend it to everybody. Um, and he's written it in homage to Alfred Russell Wallace, um, marking the bicentennial year of his birth um, as he's a described as an incomparable explorer, of course, comparable naturalist and a humanitarian and we're going to hear about all of these interests and accomplishments tonight um thank you um so jim are you ready i am yeah oh, actually i should um, i should uh, mention um jim's um going has so much to share we're going to have a question and answer period probably around um 7 45 or 7 around 7 45 and We'll be able to answer questions. Please type your questions into chat and we'll be lining them up and you'll be able to um, um, have them answered uh, by Jim. He's able to stay until the end of uh, the hour at eight o'clock. And then since he's on the East Coast, he's going to need to leave, but we can continue to discuss afterwards. So um, at this point, um, please write any questions in, in a chat and we're ready to go. Thank you so much, Jim. Great. Yeah, thank you, Katie, for that very nice introduction. I'm going to try to see if I can share my screen here. Thank you, um, Katie, for this this nice uh, in, invitation, and also a shout out to Frank for very kindly recommending me. Um, so it's it's a real pleasure to have a chance to um, share with you all um, some of some of my. Um, my passion, let's say, for for this very interesting individual, Alfred Alfred Russell Wallace, and I think um, as we go on, maybe the the title of my book, Radical by Nature, will become um, pretty pretty obvious. Um, that this is um, kind of a, a very interesting, radical, out of the box, um, outside the box kind of kind of thinker, um, and it's hard to sort of you know, really wrap your mind around the diversity of interests of, of Wallace. Um, and um, in trying to think about like how to sort of express that, um, you know, his, his many facets um, to, to, to others, I was, I was struck years ago um, when I, I came across this um, remark made by uh, Gilbert Chesterton back in, in, in a 1904 article and I thought it was really remarkable where Chesterton said, um, if I were asked who ought to be regarded in future ages as the greatest man of our time, I should hesitate between Walt Whitman and Alfred Russell Wallace. And I, that really struck me. Um, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a, a fan of, of Whitman's and I thought, how curious to sort of bring these two figures together. And I, I, I sort of mused on that. He, he didn't elaborate, so I mused on it. And and I realized that well, there's, there's a number of commonalities, but but one that really struck me was this idea of um, of the multitudinous um, personality, a real largeness of spirit and of outlook. And um, you know, this is this is a, a, a quote from Whitman from Song of Myself, uh, and I thought it actually encapsulates um, Alfred Russell Wallace pretty pretty well. You know, where Whitman says, um, "Do I contradict myself?" Well, very well then. I contradict myself. I, I am large. I contain multitudes, and and I thought you know that that does nicely express Wallace because he is large. He contains multitudes, and you know some would say that in some ways um, his his um, some of these facets of, of Wallace are contradictory. You know his scientific and what some would say were less scientific or even non-scientific um, interests that seem to, to contrast and even clash. Um, so, you know, I, I think that it's useful to start with thinking about um, Wallace as a, as, as a multitudinous 
individual. Um, but I think that most of us, especially in um, natural sciences, you know, we 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 really think about him largely um, in terms of his contributions to to science. You know, he is recognized, um, was recognized even in his day as a, as a preeminent tropical biologist. Um, we honor him as co-discoverer with Darwin of the principle of natural selection, um, as the founder of the modern field of evolutionary biogeography, um, really through a succession of papers, but then especially some of his landmark books of the 1870s, um, 1880. Um, but then curiously, you know, later too, he's um, he's deeply into the, the spiritualist movement of the 19th century. He's a self-avowed socialist. He is a, a tireless campaigner for social reform of various kinds, um, land reform, labor reform, women's suffrage, and, and so on. Um, really, um, you know, vast interests, uh, extremely energetic individual who produces this just voluminous output of, of articles and letters and interviews and books, you know, truly remarkable. And I tried to think about how to express that. And I, I'm going to you know, just read a little bit here um, from the uh, preface to my book, um, where I try to kind of um, capture that, that aspect of like wrapping yourself, your, your mind around the multitudinous um, Wallace. And and also appreciating the radical of the revolutionary in Wallace. So I write, um, if we had to choose one word to sum up Wallace, radical might be the most appropriate. Not a radical of the bomb throwing persuasion, certainly. He was not one to tear down received truths or institutions gratuitously. No, this radical was more of the envelope pushing persuasion, an explorer, philosopher, observer, and activist holding up a mirror to society a humanitarian naturalist with a penchant for out-of-the-box thinking who saw truths about the natural world and the human condition. The two were of a piece for Wallace, after all, the boundary between the human and non-human worlds permeable, depending on the angle the question was viewed from. That was very Wallace. His was a life marked by borders, boundaries, and lines of delineation, literal and figurative, lines he drew and lines he erased lines he respected and lines he transgressed, lines he discovered, lines he thought he discovered. Yes, Wallace was multitudinous, all right, capacious enough to contain contradictions and radical enough that every one of them was startlingly original. So thinking about the multitudinous Wallace again, as as um, we in the in the sciences, we we think about his landmark scientific works, and these are just a selection of of some of his books, um, his geographical distribution of animals of 1876, island life of 1880. Um, these are really even in their time were recognized as as uh, as foundational texts, um, but then you know he also has this vast output. Um, in terms of his social and economic, uh, ethical and spiritualist interests, you know, books um, like Land Nationalization or The Revolt of Democracy, um, Social Environment and Moral Progress. Um, you can tell this is an individual who's uh, utterly passionate about these issues of, of social justice. And so it's curious to th think about um, Wallace kind of balancing these two aspects of his uh, of his life. Um, by the end of his life, certainly he was one of the most famous scientists worldwide. Um, he was honored by the end of his life for 30 honorary memberships, um, you know, a, a little pile of medals and, you know, the, 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 the British crown's highest uh, civilian honor, the Order of Merit, honorary degrees from the University of Dublin and Oxford University, actually declined degrees from Cambridge and the University of Wales um, later later in life. Um, so he, he's he's lauded, um, and yet, despite that, today you know I find that mo modern students, uh, let alone those outside of the sciences, um, have hardly ever heard of this individual. He's just almost wholly unknown. And so um, in writing this book, I wanted to try to express, you know, well, who, who is this interesting individual? Who is Alfred Russell Wallace? Can, can we understand perhaps why 
he has been eclipsed in, in many ways. Um, uh, and, and in particular in the sciences by um, his esteemed colleague and friend, um, Charles Darwin. So that was kind of my, my starting point. And I guess the starting point here to sort of try to express the multitudinous aspects of, of Wallace. Um, to tell a, a, a bit of the story of his life um, very quickly, I, I, you'll find that a, a, a common theme is this idea of, of borderlands and boundaries. And so I, I found it resonant that Wallace was actually born sort of in a borderland twice over almost. He was born as we as was noted earlier, um, on the 8th of January, 1823, um, in the little town of Usk, really more precisely, Flanbatic, a small little hamlet, you know, just on the edge of Usk. Um, and this was in uh, the county of, of, of uh, Monmouthshire. And it's interesting that this is a borderland um, in, in more than a metaphorical sense between Wales and England. This was actually disputed territory. And, and um, you might find it interesting to know that the, the boundary and, and the, the, the positioning of this county within Wales was really not fully settled until the 1970s, interestingly enough. Um, but, but more than that, uh, I thought it was, it was resonant too, that it turns out that um, Wallace was born atop a geological fault. I thought this was quite interesting. And somehow I thought this was you know, resonant with this idea of, um, you know, ex exemplifying a geological dynamism that really helps shape this planet and the life upon it that Wallace really um, had great insight into. Um, so he's born atop the Flanbatic Fault, which actually lies at the very edge of a great uh, anticline called the Usk Inlier. And uh, an anticline is a great kind of arched formation, as you see in the lower right here, of, of, um, of uh, deformed strata. And um, because the strata may be made of, of, of rocks of different composition, they might be differing in hardness and they erode at different rates. And that leaves a kind of characteristic um, ridged pattern in the landscape. And um, that's exactly what you see in, in uh, at Wallace's birthplace. He's literally born um, in in a in a cottage that's that's uh, backed right up against a bank that forms um, one of these um, uh, outcroppings of the Great Usk Inlier. And so it's interesting and resonant as a borderland twice over. You know, he uh, a borderland of space and time, really. And the geology just to the back of this house is very different from the geology across the river. Um, so, you know, again, Wallace is too young to appreciate that, have any knowledge of it, probably or well, certainly. Um, but I, I found it rather resonant to, to think about Wallace kind of born in kind of disputed territory in a sense and, and in a geological um, interesting borderland in space and time. Um, he lived in, in us really only um, for his first few years when he's about six, the family moved to the town of, of Hartford where his mother was from. Um, and he went to grammar school uh, at that time, um, but his formal schooling really ended at age 14 when his father uh, rather suddenly and unexpectedly died. Um, so thereafter, you know, um, uh, Alfred had to leave school and um, begin to uh, consider working to help support the family. Um, he was, after that time, self-taught by reading in the free libraries of the Mechanics Institutes. Um, he worked for his eldest brother as a surveyor, um, and his um, his um, second oldest brother, um, as a, who was an apprentice builder at one time, um, he spent one year as a school teacher at age 21, when a downturn in the surveying business led his um, brother to have to lay him off for about a year. Um, but then his brother, um, too, unexpectedly died, and that was quite a tragedy. And the young, um, you know, tw uh, 21, 22 year old. Um, then um, moved back to Wales to try to take over and run uh, his eldest brother's surveying business at, at that time. Um, and he moved to Neath um, with his brother, John. Um, so really, you know, his formal education um, really ended with grammar school about age 14. 
And he is really very much an autodidact after that. And we have a fairly good sense, a good record of the sorts of things that the young Wallace is interested in. And um, it's quite an eclectic kind of menu of books. Um, you know, he's seeking inspiration, clearly a, a taste for science, you know, reading, you know, some of the, the, the classic um, travel explorers like Alexander von Humboldt, um, even reading Darwin, of course, his, his best-selling uh, Voyage of the Beagle, then known as the Journal of Researches. He read Charles Lyell's um, classic uh, and very important um, treatise, uh, Principles of Geology. So we, we get a sense that he has a taste for the natural world uh, and for natural history. But he's also reading about um, social revolutionaries. You know, he's reading um, Thomas Paine's Age of Reason, for example. He's reading uh, the great uh, philanthropist, reformer, Robert Owen, um, the, the Welsh reformer, actually lectured in London um, at one point where, where Wallace was able uh, to, to hear him speak as a, as a teenager. Um, Owen, I think, had a very deep and lasting impression on, on Wallace and probably really helped shape the whole course of his, you know, kind of the social justice um, aspect of, of, of his rich life. Um, Owen published The New Moral World um, and various other treatises. He was the founder of great social experiments like New Lanark in Scotland and New Harmony, Indiana. These were communitarian um, kind of cooperative societies that he was experimenting with. Um, none of them quite did, you know, very well for very long, but um, it was the spirit of the thing. You know, he was ever um, uh, trying to advance, you know, the, the cause of, of the improvement of the, of the human condition, really. And, uh, and that really deeply resonated with, um, with, with Wallace. And we find, too, that, that Wallace at that time had a taste for even... Um, the incendiary, right? The, the revolutionary. And this says something perhaps about his personality. Um, he's really very, very given to um, iconoclastic thinking. He, he will give the time of day to listening to ideas that most others would have dismissed at the time, including, for example, um, the vestiges of the natural history of creation. This was a uh, an early kind of proto-evolutionary uh, tract that talked about um, transmutational processes from the cosmic level all the way down to the social and political level, and was really um, considered to be quite scandalous in the day. It was it was published anonymously, and um, and the authorship was really the the subject of um, of tremendous and intense speculation. Now this book is published in in, in 1844. And it's fair to say that um, Wallace um, came across this book, read it the following year, and um, and was completely taken with its argument, this idea of transmutational change in all things. He was only 22 years at the time, and this converted him to the idea of transmutation, again, quite a heretical idea at the time. Um, in 1844, that was the year that Wallace was laid off by his brother. Um, he found a, a job for a year in the town of Leicester as a, as a school teacher. And it was really quite fortuitous because in that year, he met um, a really a, a kindred spirit, Henry Walter Bates, um, about the same age, uh, keenly interested in entomology, really keen kind of beetle collector and butterfly collector, and, and really turned Wallace on to the joys of, of, of insect collecting. And um, when, when Wallace's brother um, died prematurely at the end of this year, and he moved away from Leicester over to Neath to um, try to you know, take on his brother's business, uh, the two, um, Wallace and Bates, kept up a correspondence. And this is quite fortuitous. Um, you know, the, the, the wonderful thing is this documentary record um, survives. And so we have um, th these actual letters where, for example, uh, Wallace writes to Bates in November of 1845, have you read vestiges of the natural history of creation or is it out of your line? And um, you see the um, the, the response itself um, is not in evidence, it didn't survive, but you can get the, the tenor of, uh, of Bates's response from Wallace's letter back to Bates in December of 1845, where he writes, as you see here, I have a more favorable opinion of the vestiges than you appear to have. 
I don't consider it a hasty generalization. Wallace calls it an ingenious hypothesis, strongly supported by striking facts. And he kind of goes on and on in this, in this remarkable letter. And their, their correspondence continued for, for quite a time. Uh, two years later, um, we find Wallace writing to Bates, um, expressing dissatisfaction with a mere local insect collection. Um, he says he'd like to study thoroughly some widely distributed insect family. And very tellingly, in this letter, he writes, principally with a view to the theory of the origin of species. And then he concludes, by that means, I'm strongly of opinion that some definite results might be arrived at. Um, so this is the one very clear indication that Wallace and his friend Bates are really thinking very seriously about what some viewed as and even called the mystery of mysteries, one of the greatest of the, of the scientific mysteries and philosophical questions, the nature of species, the origin of species. And if you think about it, it's quite audacious, I think, for these two young guys with re really very little formal education and virtually no resources or prospects, really kind of dreaming big and thinking about you know, this idea that they could they, they, they could actually study some of the, the biggest philosophical questions of the day. And um, the, the truly remarkable thing is not just the audacity of, of, of dreaming, but of actually making this dream come true. So it's astonishing to me that just six months later after writing that letter, Wallace and Bates find themselves in Amazonia um, you know, these naturalists find themselves in, in a tropical paradise. Um, they, they manage to bum their way across the Atlantic. They have a kind of a plan, a, an agent in London. They'll collect specimens. They will send them back to their agent. This is a time when museums, uh, wealthy collectors are, are um, eager to, to, uh, to purchase these tropical rarities. And so their agent could then sell them, send re the, the, the funds back to uh, the Amazon. And in this way, they could kind of fund their, their explorations. And it's worth noting that they're, they're really sending duplicate specimens or saving a tremendous amount of their own material for their own study. So it's not simply that they're, they're, they're collectors. Um, I like to make the point really that, that Wallace did not travel to collect so much as he collected to travel, right? It's um, something of a myth and a misconception that Wallace was maybe some mere specimen collector who kind of, you know, blundered into, you know, making some interesting discoveries. No, it's, it's very, very clear that, um, that Wallace and Bates too were very, very deliberate in what they wanted to investigate, um, including in their, in, in their collecting. Um, diversity, distribution, geology, um, anthropology, right? Um, we've, we have a really a, a meticulous record of, of Wallace's explorations of the Rio Negro and the, and the Huapes River. He's literally surveying these rivers as he's traveling um, upriver. This is the drawing that you see here is Wallace's hand-drawn map of the Rio Negro and the river and the Rio Huapes um, that, that he actually surveyed. You know, can I kind of imagine him in, you know, sort of, you know, canoes, he's got surveying equipment, even while he's collecting and making observations and, and writing papers and, and all of this. It's really quite, quite remarkable. Um, he also is, um, he has a, a, a pretty nice um, eye for drawing. Um, he's, um, making observations of the um, fish of the Amazon and the, the Rio Negro. He's um, drawing sketches of the forest. He's meticulously trying to document palms. There's a special interest in palm trees. And of course, um, ethnological observations. He's living among and working among the indigenous people, um, the Banawa and, and others, and um, sketching out their abodes and their um, their artifacts and um, purchases some, in, in fact, and hoping to take them back to, to, to London with him eventually. And I say hoping to take them back because actually these sketches you see here are some of the very few that survive Wallace's four years in Amazonia. Um, at the end of four years and, and, and after some illness and after the tragic death of his youngest brother who came out to assist him, um, that was a real tragedy, 
Um, Wallace found that almost two years worth of his specimens that he had been sending down river were held up in customs. He had to resolve all of that. And then finally in 1852, he was heading home um, with all of his notebooks and his, um, his drawings, um, a menagerie of live animals, um, an enormous amount of specimens when um, tragedy struck yet again. I mean, just a really serious blow. You just, I, it's just almost impossible to imagine um, how staggering this would have been to have your ship burn mid-Atlantic. Um, fortunately, nobody lost their lives. Um, Wallace and the crew were adrift for 10 days in a lifeboat um, before they were just fortuitously uh, rescued by, uh, by, by a passing ship, which itself almost then wrecked in the English Channel. Um, imagine how devastating this was, you know, losing everything, really. I mean, all, virtually all of his notebooks, just a little packet of drawings were saved. Um, all of the, the, the poor animals, the live animals he had, all of those specimens from almost two years gone. You know, it must have been just absolutely devastating. Um, and I'm sure it was. It was a heavy, a heavy, heavy burden. Um, and yet, you know, we do see the optimist in Wallace as he's relating his ordeal. Um, he also is one to point out that the glass is half full. You know, um, for example, being on his back in a lifeboat in the middle of the Atlantic um, was the perfect place to be observing meteors, for example. You know, and that's, I, I, I love that comment that he makes uh, in Travels on the Amazon. It's sort of emblematic of his um, his his optimism, you know. Um, so he's going to kind of just, you know, um, get up and, you know, brush himself off and off he's going to go. And luckily for him, really, he had sent so much material um, back to England um, ahead of time, not to mention um, lengthy letters and papers um, and, and notes that he was actually able in the year after he returned alive to England to actually publish an astonishing seven papers and two books. I mean, remarkably, he had enough material um, to pull together from his letters and, and, and other sources that he could write his narrative of travels on the Amazon and Rio Negro, and actually um, a small book on the palm trees of the Amazon, as well as several papers. Really quite, quite astonishing, considering how much material he had lost. Um, one of those papers that he read um, this was in November and December of 1853, gives us a little insight into the kinds of transmutational or evolutionary um, speculations that he had uh, at the time. So this was a paper um, on the Amazonian heliconius butterflies, the long wing butterflies. And in this very long paper, he observes how they're very rich in closely related species and varieties. They often have a very limited range. They seem to be found, he notes, in geologically very young or recent areas. And then he, he makes a very telling um, observation or, or speculation, maybe. He, he comments in this paper that we may fairly regard those insects which are peculiar to geologically young or recent areas as among the youngest of species the latest in the long series of modifications which the forms of animal life have undergone. Um, so this is again a very um, explicit, rather evolutionary um, statement. You know, he's thinking in terms of the origin of species, and he's thinking in geologic terms that, that somehow geological change is, is sort of engendering species change. And of course, he has no idea um, how this might occur. So once he's home and reunited with his family, this is a photograph of, of Wallace taken that year um, with his mother and, and his sister. Um, he's, um, he's nursed back to health um, and he vows that, um, you know, boy, that was a close one. You know, if I, if I just reach England alive, I am never going to trust myself on the ocean again, right? Um, well... <laughs> 18 months later, you know, um, Wallace, maybe because he had lost so much um, in that transatlantic um, journey that, that where his ship burned, um, he decided to keep exploring. He needed to head out again. And this time he headed east 
uh, to the great uh, Malay archipelago, the great Indonesian archipelago um, that extends really from um, Singapore and peninsular um, Malaysia there uh, in the west, all the way across to the Aru Islands and New Guinea uh, in the east. Um, he spends the next eight years there. But I want I want to sort of make note that the wheels are constantly turning. He's thinking about these evolutionary ideas because less than a year after he arrives in the East, he actually writes a very long and very interesting and important paper. At least it's reckoned as important today. This paper called the Sarawak Law Paper is recognized as one of these landmark papers in the history of evolutionary biology, where he puts forth a number of propositions uh, in in paleontology, paleontological observations, and um, geographical, biogeographical observations, and he puts these together and he formulates his so-called Sarawak law. Every species has come into existence coincident in space and time with a pre-existing, closely allied species. And you see how similar that is um, in spirit to that Heliconius paper comment. Um, he's thinking about the origin of species and what what could be responsible for this for this process. He notes in his paper that this law connects together and renders intelligible a vast number of independent and hereto unex, uh, hitherto unexplained facts about species. He's thinking very big picture, and he's really beginning to connect a variety of dots, looking at at patterns in nature and trying to infer process from pattern, which I, I find really remarkable. Um, around this time, maybe a little bit later, he starts this, um, opens this notebook that is now called the Species Notebook. And um, this is especially interesting, a notebook that I've had the, the, the privilege to study very closely. It contains extensive arguments in favor of this idea of transmutation as evolution was known then. And that includes 24 pages where he explicitly is aiming to refute the geologist Charles Lyell's anti-transmutation arguments. That, that structure there, refuting Lyell's arguments, um, he reveals in this notebook, was to be the, the um, essential um, outline for uh, a, tr a pro-transmutation book that he's planning. And this whole section opens up with the page that I reproduce here that's called Note for Organic Law of Change. And it's been speculated that this book may have been called um, On the Organic Law of Change. And this is uh, the published version of this notebook um, that I have the uh, again, the, the privilege really of studying thanks to the Linnaean Society of London and working with Harvard University Press um, back in, in 2013. Um, so I wanted to sort of um, expand on that just a little bit because I think it's essential to understanding Wallace's MO as he's in this ferment of thought when he's in the field. Charles Lyell, the great geologist, is both an inspiration and also Wallace's foil um, because it was well known at the time that Lyell's attacks on transmutation in his um, famous Principles of Geology, th those attacks were taken as the definitive statement, the damning statement on the matter, really closing the book on the possibility of species change. And so in his notebook, it's not a coincidence that Wallace frames his organic law of change arguments explicitly in terms of refuting Lyell. And, um, I find that you know the, the subjects that Wallace is exploring in trying to gather evidence for this idea of species change turns out to be remarkably congruent with the lines of evidence that, unbeknownst to him, Charles Darwin has been exploring really for some you know almost twenty years since. Um, and so here's just a little a table where I just kind of compare. Wallace's musings on a, on a variety of subjects on um, transmutation with Darwin's musings on the very same subjects. And the list kind of goes on from transmutation to observations in geology and paleontology, instinct and, and habit or, or behavior. 
um, the human primate relationship and the nature of human variation, geographical distribution, morphology and morphological affinities between organisms. It kind of goes, goes on and on. You get a sense of how remarkably parallel these two individuals are in their lines of investigation, of course, completely unknown to each other, right? Um, this was an analysis that I had published um, uh, based on the study of the species notebook in, in, in 2014 and Wallace Darwin and the origin of species. Well, it wasn't too much longer before uh, Wallace actually did hit upon the mechanism of species change. I call this bursting the limit of species. He had his eureka moment um, while in a malarial uh, fever as he laid uh, in his cot in um, the small village of um, Dodinga on Halmahera, then known as Jilolo, in February of 1858. When he was well enough, um, uh, he had returned to his base at the uh, in the neighboring island of Ternate, which was a major um, trading center at that time. And he wrote out a fair copy of his essay and he sent it to Charles Darwin. And not a coincidence, he had already been in touch with Darwin and each of them knew that the other is interested in these questions about the nature of species. Um, and it's not a coincidence that in his cover letter to Darwin, he asked him that if he thought it was worth much to please send it to Lyle, right? That was really the object of Wallace's essay. He's sending this to Lyle, who of course, again, is the, is the great voice of anti-evolution at the time. Um, well, Darwin, as you can imagine, is devastated at the arrival of this manuscript. Um, but very quickly, his friends, Lyle and also Joseph Hooker, the botanist, very quickly arranged for Wallace's paper to be read publicly at the Linnaean Society of London, um, but prefaced really by a number of unpublished extracts from a number of writings and letters that, that Darwin had written. Um, and this is no doubt intended to help kind of um, show that while that Darwin had been working on this for so long and, and, and preserve his priority. Um, Darwin then really doubled down on his efforts to um, produce uh, his, his great work, uh, a book on this subject. He was, his original title was Natural Selection. It would have been quite a long volume, but he published uh, an abridged version, let's say, that he called an abstract, and we know it as On the Origin of Species, published in November of 1859. And, and I find it poignant that at some point in 1858, when Darwin is still using the title natural selection, he must have sent in a letter uh, an outline of his table of contents because here it is written out by Wallace in his species notebook. Um, remarkable. So these are um, th this is um, Darwin's outline for natural selection. Um, and Wallace, um, Wallace had nothing but admiration for, for Darwin's accomplishments. And then he decided to simply abandon his own book plans. He never, he never produced his own planned volume. And that, that's a real pity, I think. Um, when he did return to England in 1862, he was, of course, famous, famous as the co-discoverer of, uh, of natural selection, um, uh, famous for, um, you know, his just, you know, remarkable uh, feat of covering some 14,000 miles that he wrote dozens of papers and, and published letters in that interval, uh, collecting an estimated 125,000 specimens, more than a thousand easily new to science. His landmark discoveries like natural selection, Wallace's line. Um, here you have a, a portrait of um, his, his, his close friend and assistant, Ali, who helped him really throughout um, most of his journeys in, in the East. And I thought that um, you might find it as poignant as I do this. Um, I'll, read, I'll read you a little passage from, from my book about a, a remarkable um, in, uh, uh, incident that, that occurred um, with Ali much later. Um, so um, much, much later, let's see here. 
1907 to be exact, the American herpetologist Thomas Barber of Harvard's uh, Museum of Comparative Zoology was on an extended honeymoon with his wife, Rosamond Pierce, traveling in the Malay Archipelago in Wallace's footsteps. They were on Trinate, just heading out on a collecting jaunt when an old man approached them. Barber later related what happened. Here came a real thrill, for I was stopped on the street one day as my wife and I were preparing to climb up to the crater lake. We were stopped by a wizened old Malay man. I can see him now with a faded blue fez on his head. He said, I am Ali Wallace. I knew at once there stood before me Wallace's faithful companion of many years, the boy who not only helped him collect but nursed him when he was sick. We took his photograph and sent it to Wallace when we got home. He wrote me a delightful letter acknowledging it and reminiscing over the time when Ali saved his life, nursing him through a terrific attack of, attack of malaria. I think it says something about the relationship of these two, one born of mutual respect, and affection and trust that grows from shared triumphs, trials, and tribulations that Wallace's steadfast assistant of old would actually take his name. So I want to sort of expand a bit on the remarkable accomplishments of Wallace in the years um, after his return. Um, I mentioned already, um, of course, natural selection and also the Wallace line, this remarkable line in space and time, this delineation of the Australasian and Indo-Malayan biogeographic realms, um, as they are called today. This is a, a map that Wallace published in 1863, kind of this, this great delineation between these two great faunal realms. And you need to sort of appreciate that these biogeographic realms exist by virtue of a very dynamic and deep earth history, both geological history and climatic history. And Wallace really had a, a, a keen sense of that. He had he had these great insights that these, these past epics of, of earth history are shaping the geographical distribution of species that we see today. Um, and now this entire region uh, actually um, is called Wallacea, so another way of, of honoring Wallace. Um, in, in that same decade, Wallace came forth with a, a novel model of human evolution, human physical and social evolution. Um, this was a paper that was read uh, at the Anthropological Society in 1864. And it was really a, a, a very original suggestion that human evolution proceeded in two phases, that very early on, natural selection shaped humans bodily, and to some extent in mind, but that later, phase two, selection stopped acting on the body and mainly our evolution uh, proceeded um, mentally and morally, right? Our, our cognitive capacities. And this was really a, a, a novel idea that sort of tied together arguments of the time over you know, um, the unity of humanity and uh, the antiquity of, uh, uh, of peoples of the world. Darwin was certainly really taken with this idea. Um, here you see a quote from a letter from Darwin. He said, the great idea, the, the, the great leading idea is quite new to me that during late ages, the mind would have been modified more than the body. Um, Darwin actually incorporated Wallace's argument into chapter five of Descent of Man, his second most uh, famous and important book. Um, he combined Wallace's ideas with similar uh, uh, speculations from Spencer and Galton, um, but essentially it's a very Wallacean idea about um, human physical and then um, sort of mental and social evolution. But this is also getting into around the time that Wallace actually changes his mind over the nature of the mind. And so this, as you can imagine, came as something of a shock to Darwin. Um, Wallace came to believe that the brain, the human brain, could not evolve by stepwise gradual selection. And, and he was really being a, a sort of uber selectionist in making this argument because According to the logic of natural selection, every step in a gradual series must be of use to uh, in its time and place. And yet, um, if very complex mental faculties were of no use to humans in a so-called primitive state, 
and yet all humans have these capabilities, well, then that suggests that these capabilities could not have evolved gradually in that way. And this really sort of resonated with, with Wallace's conversion to, um, to spiritualism around this time. Um, very interesting. Um, it started probably around 1865, um, uh, 66. And then in 1869, he actually um, made a public, his first public statement um, about spiritualism. Um, Darwin, of course, is quite upset with this. Um, he wrote to Wallace, I hope you've not murdered too completely your own and my child. And in another letter, he said, as you expected, I differ grievously from you, and I'm very sorry for it. Um, so you can imagine that this really strained their relationship, but it never really broke their relationship. They remained lifelong friends um, and engaged with each other over scientific ideas for, for years and years until um, the end of, of, of Darwin's life. Excuse me, Jim, let me jump in real quick here to thank our sponsors, and then we can get back to this wonderful presentation about Alfred Russell Wallace. Tonight, we'd like to give special thanks to the San Francisco Elks Lodge Number no. 3 for their generous support of our programs and Lakeside Chat Productions this year. A generous 2023 Beacon Grant allowed Rotary Nature Center friends to provide education and community building activities illustrated here and more. Our heartfelt gratitude. We also thank the City of Oakland's um, KTOP TV Channel 10 for rebroadcasting our shows every month from 6 to 7 p.m. on Sundays on KTOP TV. Tune in for both um, past shows and also for uh, our current month's show. We thank the Frederick E. Hart Foundation for Educational Opportunity for their generous support of our video programs and our productions and programs. We want to thank you for coming and want to see you again in May. Information will be coming out on our social media and by email. Coming up in a few weeks, we have our April 22nd Earth Day um, event at Lake Mara. We will be celebrating Earth Day with Adopt a Spot in the city of Oakland at the Sailboat House March and at the Rotary Nature Center grounds. Meet in the parking lot by the Sailboat House at 568 Bellevue Avenue at 10 a.m. Uh, for our activities. On April 30th, we will be participating with the Oakland Museum, Nature Center, and a group of collaborating nonprofits to host the Lake Merritt Nature Challenge, the Lake Merritt City Nature Challenge. This is an opportunity to use iNaturalist to document biodiversity in the city, and especially to see how Lake Merritt is recovering from a difficult year. We look forward to seeing people. On May 5th, we'll have our next monthly Lakeside Chat uh, with uh, Jay Southward from the San Francisco Microscopical Society. Uh, her talk will be Microscopic Marvels of Lagoon Merit. And this will be 7 to 8 p.m. free on Zoom. The event by registration will be coming shortly. We want to thank all of our volunteers, program participants, and our partners. If you enjoy what we do, please consider making a donation to Rotary Nature Center Friends um, by sending your donation to this uh, post office box or visiting our website and using the easy donation button. Birthday is coming up this very Saturday. Hope to see everyone. Uh, the Bio Blitz is going to be a lot of fun and it will be uh, meaningful as well. We thank Rob Lamone, our producer, and Katie Noonan and David Wofford, co-chairs of Rotary Nature Center Friends, and all of our staff for their wonderful help. Rotary Nature Center Friends is an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit advocating for the Rotary Nature Center in Lakeside Park as an interpretive education and science center for all the people of Oakland and as a steward of the Lake Merritt Wildlife Refuge. Thank you so much. And now 
back to our discussion. Um, I wanted to sort of explain just a little bit more this uh, this public declaration of spiritualism. Like, what is Wallace thinking? And I, I want you to to sort of realize that first of all, don't confuse spiritualism with spirituality, right? So he is not any in in any sense a conventional religious thinker, um, but rather. At that time, this idea of a kind of parallel spirit realm was all the rage, really, at all levels of society. And it was really in keeping with Wallace's kind of radical, you know, um, kind of out of the box thinking personality that that he's willing to listen to these claims um, about people being able to communicate with um, with with, uh, with the dead that may dwell in this kind of spirit realm. And he makes an interesting argument. He saw the possibility of a spirit realm as really perhaps another branch of natural history. And his argument is very logical. He says, look, you know, the existence of sentient beings uncognizable by our senses, they wouldn't contravene natural law any more than did the discovery of the true nature of protozoa. You know, hundreds of years ago, you know, um, who could have believed that little animalcules lived in a drop of water, but with the right technology, you know, the microscope, we can actually visualize these, these organisms. And so maybe if we had the right technology, we could somehow, you know, um, detect this kind of parallel realm. And then he says um, in 1875, the existence of such Peter human intelligences, if proved, would only add another and more striking illustration than any we've yet received of how small a portion of the cosmos our senses give us cognizance. Um, well, that's quite true. I mean, that you know, if proved, and that was the key. He was very keen on his fellow naturalists taking this seriously and trying to prove um, or disprove the existence of this so-called spirit realm. And to his frustration, of course, his fellow naturalists, um, you know, they simply dismissed the idea. Um, and so, of course, Wallace, being the iconoclast, would dig his heels in even more, you know. Um, but, you know, his scientific contributions just kind of go on in the, in the all through the 1860s and beyond. Um, in 1865, a truly remarkable paper, um, the phenomena of variation and geographical distribution illustrated by the swallowtail butterflies of the Malayan region. This remarkable uh, paper clarified definitions of species, varieties, geographic subspecies. He really articulates the modern so-called biological species concept, which is often attributed to much later um, evolutionary biologists. Um, and he explained in this paper how natural selection can produce parallel evolution, including um, parallelism in mimicry. Um, the, the, the puzzle of aposematism, bright warning coloration, was something that puzzled naturalists, including Darwin. And Darwin at one point asked Bates, you know, how do we explain bright colorations in caterpillars? Darwin was accustomed to thinking that bright coloration in animals typically can be explained by his mechanism of sexual selection. But caterpillars are not adults. It's the juvenile stage of the butterfly or the moth, right? So what advantage could there be to these things being brightly colored? And Bates really scratched his head and said, I don't know, you better ask Wallace, you know. Well, Wallace hit the nail on the head as um, as, as Darwin wrote to him. Um, Bates was quite right. You're, you're the man to apply to in a difficulty. I never heard anything more ingenious than your suggestion. Um, so we can sort of honor Wallace as the originator of this idea of um, aposematic coloration, bright warning coloration, signaling distastefulness so that birds would um, learn to associate the bright colors with um, with unpalatability and avoid um, these, these species. When Darwin related this in Descent of Man, he mentioned that Wallace had an innate genius for solving difficulties. In the 1860s too, Wallace married. Um, he married a, a bit late. Um, uh, Annie Wallace, Annie uh, Mitten, was the daughter of a, of a prominent um, 
a bryologist, a moss specialist at the time. Um, they started a family. They they had three children, only two of whom survived to adulthood. Their, their firstborn, Bertie, um, tragically succumbed to, to disease, as so many kids did in, in those in those days. Um, but that that was a uh, an important year for Wallace personally, but also professionally. All of these important papers that I've mentioned, he caps the year off, uh, the decade off with this remarkable book, The Melee Archipelago, um, best-selling travel narrative of his adventures, eight years exploring um, in Southeast Asia. Um, he dedicates this book to Darwin, who was really quite moved by that. And Darwin wrote to him that, um, that dedication was a thing that it, for his children's children to be a pr to be proud of. Um, so really, you know, Wallace is sort of triumphant. Um, he go he moves into the 1870s and 1880s with, again, you know, one one stunning paper or book after another. You know, just redefining the field of biogeography with the 1876 volumes. Really. Um, starting, you know, founding, in a sense, the, 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 the sub-discipline of island biogeography with his book, Island Life, um, uh, pioneering novel ways of, of, of representing geographical distribution in map form. It, it kind of goes on and on. Um, in the 1880s, Wallace had a triumphant American tour. Um, he toured um, and lecturing from, uh, from the East Coast to the West Coast. Um, he was hailed in his first um, lectures in Boston as the first Darwinian. And you see from this, <clears throat> this newspaper account um, that he didn't leave a leg for anti-Darwinism Darwinism to stand on when he had got through his first Lowell lecture, a masterpiece of condensed statement, the most beautiful specimen of scientific work. Wallace was invited to the White House. Um, out in California, he um, he communed uh, with John Muir in the big trees, um, got to see some of the fabulous, you know, redwoods and, and sequoias, and actually inspired Muir to undertake his own travels of exploration. Muir later visited Brazil explicitly to follow in Wallace's footsteps. Um, he botanized with Alice Eastwood uh, in California, but and also in 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 Denver. Um, really, a, a triumphant um, a triumphant year for him. Truly, the the first Darwinian, and kind of had this this list of of accomplishments as the you know the most devastating defender of, of Darwinism. His hundreds of papers, his best selling memoir, um, evolutionary biogeography. Um, his jousting with Darwin over sexual selection, uh, his idea of reinforcement and speciation, it goes on and on. Um, but to think about Wallace as the multitudinous <laughs> thinker that he is, um, he's also a pain, right? Wallace is a thorn in the side of the scientific establishment. Um, so, you know, even while he is publishing these, you know, um, landmark works that are lauded by the scientific community, they're also just kind of scratching their head and rolling their eyes over his advocacy for spiritualism. Um, he actually argues against public support for natural history museums, which, you know, um, didn't sit well with some. Um, he attacks compulsory smallpox vaccination. He's the founding president at John Stuart Mill's invitation of the Land Nationalization Society. Um, you can imagine that to the establishment, land nationalization was not necessarily, you know, um, something that was going to go over very well. Um, but again, these kind of reflect Wallace the iconoclast, Wallace the the, the 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 passionate advocate for social justice. Um, in 1888, he declared himself a thorough socialist. Um, he had always really been something of an Owenite socialist, but but then he just publicly said, "I am a socialist." Um, and you see this um, this this uh, card on the left here, where he wrote an inscription, "Wishing yourself in the cause of socialism, every success. Believe me, yours very truly, Alfred R. Wallace." Um, and this is one of his. Um, you know, one of his uh, statements from his autobiography, My Life, um, that I, I think sums up this, this um, principled position 
uh, very, very nicely. To allow one child to be born a millionaire and another a pauper is a crime, a crime against humanity. And for those who believe in a deity, a crime against God, he says. Or Those are pretty strong words, right? And then Wallace, you know, ever creative, he does this fascinating about face on sexual selection. Um, rather late in life, um, uh, he is he reads Edward Bellamy's um, sort of utopian social novel, um, looking backward, and the idea of um, allowing women to have you know sort of free choice in marriage by by legally and economically liberating women and giving them the vote and giving them full legal you know independence and autonomy to make their own decisions especially in marriage that this will have the beneficial effect of improving society and so Wallace actually does this about face and he says now this is a form of sexual selection I can embrace and he publishes these two very important essays, Human Selection and Human Progress, Past and Future, where he rejects eugenics, he embraces equality and abolition of poverty through land and economic reform, um, women's suffrage. Um, and he, he makes this argument that this form of sexual selection can lead us to a kind of social utopia, you know. So it's really quite quite remarkable, I think. You know, Wallace, the uh, the much lauded uh, and accomplished um, naturalist, explorer, scientist, is also you know a um, a passionate humanitarian. Uh, this humanitarian is socially engaged, but he sure is no socialite. He doesn't suffer fools easily. He does not like you know kind of um, you know. Um, uh, frivolous sorts of, uh, of social engagements. Um, he's passionate about um, causes like women's suffrage, like conservation, and, um, like anti-eugenics, like the labor movement, regulation of food and drugs, land reform. It goes on and on. And so it, it is astonishing um, just how prolific Wallace is in, in both of those respects, um, both scientifically and then these, these extra scientific interests. And this is a, a photograph of, of Wallace's um, last home that he built. Um, he and his family lived here from 1902 uh, to his death in, in, um, in 1913. This was called Old Orchard. And uh, this is a, a photograph of, um, of, of, of uh, Wallace with his wife, Annie, and their daughter, um, Violet. This, was, this dates to uh, the, the early 1900s. And I thought that I would just read you very quickly um, just from a, a letter uh, that I think really sums up um, all of Wallace's multifaceted interests at this time. This is a letter to Violet, actually. Um, and um, the context is that Violet uh, wrote her father that she's quite annoyed with him because um, he's not answering her letters. So Wallace, um, so he, I'll just read my, my passage here. Violet was annoyed with her dad. He was a miserable correspondent, she berated, her letters languishing for weeks unanswered. My dear Violet, he wrote in his defense, if you had letters almost every day about Darwinism, spiritualism, vaccinations, socialism, traveling, dog's tails, cat's whiskers, glaciers, orchids, et cetera, et cetera, and had books sent to you on all these subjects to acknowledge and read and request for information on other subjects and other subjects and other subjects and a book to write and a garden to attend and four orchid houses and chess to play and visitors to see and calls to make and plants to name and, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Perhaps you would be a miserable letter writer too. Perhaps also not. <laughs> It was true enough. It was late 1896, and he was busier than ever at nearly 74 years old. The sage of Dorset, his advice and opinion sought on all manner of subjects, many of which he said, I know nothing except general principles, and these go a long way with the ignorant. Yes, he was swamped, and he pleaded special dispensation from Violet, signing off his letter, your affectionate and much abused pa. So I, I really love that letter because I think it just really encapsulates so nicely both, you know, his his multifaceted interests, but also his very warm relationship um, with his daughter um, and and others that that exemplify that with 
um, with other members of, of his family. So although he has these many and varied interests, I mean, Wallace is really on his scientific game to the very end. And um, just recently, I had the, the pleasure of, of, of studying with, um, with a friend, George Beccoloni, um, the, uh, the outline, the handwritten outline to Wallace's last unrealized book. It would have been called Darwin and Wallace. It would have been published by John Murray, um, the same publisher who published um, uh, Darwin in spring of 1915. And um, you see Wallace's subtitle here, a study of their literary and scientific writings with an estimate of the present position of the theory of natural selection as an adequate explanation for the process of organic evolution. And he reveals in this outline um, his um, how he would defend um, his ideas, his and Darwin's ideas against the um, the, the, the burgeoning arguments of the neo-Lamarckians and the mutationists and the, the, uh, the, the Mendelians at, at, at the time. Um, but unfortunately, this book was, was, not, uh, was not to be realized as Wallace died um, in, uh, in 1913 um, before this could be uh, attempted. Um, this is just um, a notice about the paper that um, George and I published just, just last week. This came out and it's freely available online. So if you're, you're curious about Wallace's um, unrealized last book, um, you can download a, a, a free copy from Notes and Records of the Royal Society. So I'm just going to conclude very quickly here by returning to um, this idea of the multitudinous Wallace. Um, you know, I hope that I've convinced you that um, Wallace really is large and contains multitudes, even contradictory aspects, per perhaps. And, um, and there really is a, a fascinating congruence between this idea uh, with, with, with Wallace and Whitman. And as you can see here, they even look a lot alike, which is pretty remarkable. That's Whitman there on the, on the right. Um, so I'm just going to conclude with a very brief reading uh, from my coda, um, where I kind of play with this, this idea, um, thinking about the multitudinous Wallace. The Wallace line is an apt metaphor for the many explorations of borderland and boundary that we've seen crisscrossing Wallace's remarkable life, biogeographical and geological, certainly, but there also exists the Wallace line of science and society, humans and nature, physical and spirit worlds, rich and poor, civilized and savage, privileged and powerless, Wallace's time and ours. The subtitle to historian Ted Benton's treatment of Wallace's life rhetorically asks, a thinker for our own times? Indeed, Alfred Russell Wallace is a thinker and role model for our times and beyond, for the ages, his life of curiosity, adventure, genius, discovery, and advocacy inspired and inspiring in equal measure. Like Whitman, he contained multitudes with a largeness of spirit and diversity of perspectives that embraced even self-contradiction at times. And that's okay. Like Whitman too, Wallace beckons to us still from beyond some borderland of being, metamorphosed in a way that Ovid would appreciate, and here I quote from Whitman, I bequeath myself to the dirt to grow from the grass I love. If you want me again, look for me under your boot soles. You'll hardly know who I am or what I mean, but I shall be good health to you nevertheless and filter and fiber your blood. Failing to fetch me at first, keep encouraged. Missing me one place, search another. I stop somewhere waiting for you. We would do well to keep searching for Alfred Russell Wallace um, in the wide world, certainly, but especially within ourselves. And with that, I want to thank you all very much for uh, for your attention. Thank you, Jim. That was amazing. And I'd like to know if you could take a couple of questions before you yes. have to leave early, uh, or not early, but you have to leave for um, to tomorrow's engagement. So yeah, yeah, uh, certainly. Great yeah. questions in here. And I will just um, stop my share maybe. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, um, there we go. so um, uh, Tony asks, how would Wallace fit in today's culture and society? Do you think what group would he pose as the biggest thorn to today? 
Would it be CNN <laughs> or Fox News panelist? Hello. <laughs> well, yeah, interesting to contemplate. Um, the iconoclastic Wallace would would ever be the thorn in the side of of the establishment, <laughs> I, I suspect, and many of the injustices that he decried in his time still exist. Um, so he he would be quite pleased that advances have been made in many respects, but he would be disappointed that um, that they haven't been made in 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 other ways in terms of of justice and uh, especially economic justice. Um, uh, yeah, I think that he would be a, a loud voice um, today um, as he was in his day of um, expressing discontent with with these issues. Okay, so um, let's see, I'm looking for the questions. Maria, help me out. So um, T, T wants to ask, unmute yes. and ask a question. Yes. Go ahead, T. Hi there. Um, I, I already put it in the chat as well. Um, essentially, where if one wanted to uh, go read um, some of his writings for ourselves, where would we go? Yeah, um, so good. So very, very good question. Um, so his writings, and most of his writings are available at Charles Smith's uh, Alfred Russell Wallace page. Um, Charles has done a tremendous service to um, the, the, the scholarly community, but really anybody. Um, he's at Western Kentucky University, um, and he has full texts of all of his papers chronologically um, presented, um, all of his books, interviews, papers, and tremendous amount of other information besides. Um, also, George Beccoloni um, has spearheaded the Wallace Correspondence Project, and so Wallace's correspondence is freely available online. Um, this is um, part of a, a number of correspondences that are available through Epsilon, which is hosted by the Cambridge University Libraries. And so all of these wonderful letters are, um, are freely available for anybody to, to peruse online. And a lot of these books are in the public domain, and some of them have never been out of print, like the Malay Archipelago, for example. And they can be, um, modern editions can, can still be readily obtained of those. Wow, very cool. Also, I wanted to add, um, thank you for your fabulous presentation. It gave a lot of rich visual context to what you were talking about, how you laid it all oh, out. You're welcome. Very you're welcome. Good. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. We have a request for um, for some of the references um, to be in chat. And I think maybe that could go in a follow-up email really soon. Would that work? Unless you have something to drop in quickly. Yeah. Sure. Oh, references to um, yeah. If you if you specify, I'm I'm happy to provide references. Yeah, yeah you mentioned some online sources that are great, and then uh, you know, and I would say read the book um, <laughs> Radical by Nature because there's oh, just a lot of fabulous footnotes and um, beautiful book, but well done book as well as lots that's in it. Thanks. We have David now. David, hand up. David Wofford. Yes, hi. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. It really well, does show the, uh, I got a real sense of the multitudes of Alfred West, <laughs> Russell Wallace. Um, actually, I, for now, I was just wondering if you could speak to, you mentioned an individual, I think it was Lytle or Lionel. Um, uh, Charles Lyle, the geologist. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it perhaps no. If, was he? There was some kind of a uh, advocate, if you will, or protagonist for who thought that who proclaimed that the Earth was flat, and they got into they placed a bet that uh, Alfred Wessel Wallace uh, oh. did not demonstrate that it was round. Yes, yes, yeah. The the sort of um. Uh, flat Earth um, wager. So this this was another you know an an interesting episode and and kind of maybe an example of Wallace's I don't know what you would call it whether it's his naivete or something you know he um you know he he thought that this was a neat idea you know that um, a bet was was published in a newspaper if someone can demonstrate that the you know the world is actually round you know. Um, 
um, I'll pay him 500 pounds, which is like a small fortune, you know, at that time. And, and, um, and Wallace, of course, ran with that because as a surveyor, you know, he had all the tools, you know, to sort of, he's like, oh, that's like rolling off a log easy. I can demonstrate that. But it turned out that, you know, the, the you know, the, the individual in question was perhaps not altogether either stable or honest. And it just turned into this, you know, kind of ongoing nightmare that actually ended up costing Wallace probably more in kind of, you know, legal fees and stress than, than the whole thing was, was ever worth. It's one of these, you know, just really un unfortunate instances that that maybe says something about Wallace's um, naivete or, or you know, I don't know what, maybe gullibility or, or something. <laughs> well, I, I wonder... Now, would that account for how he ends up becoming such a um, a socialist and, and uh, someone who's so concerned about uh, humanity and what's happening to uh, poor people and and those who are doing you know a lot of the heavy lifting? His naivete and <laughs> no, <laughs> well, well, I I I think that there it's more his innate his optimism and a sense of uh, of justice, and I I think that those seeds were planted when he was pretty young, when he was a teenager, and and reading, but also hearing, had having an opportunity to hear um, Robert Owen, who was the kind of um, you know philanthropic kind of social reformer of the time and and um was, was you know had the, had these these grand visions of how we could improve society and i think that really deeply resonated with with, with wallace and he recounts that in his autobiography um he was a, a great great fan of uh, of uh, of owen as a as a great um humanitarian and he wanted to um emulate that i think thank you Sure, thank you. I'm curious about how um, he was, so Wallace died really at the beginning of um, Darwinian synthesis and the development of a lot of um, theory of social behavior in the 20th century and then going on over into the 21st century, um, uh, including, I'm just, um, in terms of, I'm thinking about um, Michael Schirmer's book, um, Why People Believe Weird Things, if that yeah. <laughs> shed some light on, and then, of course, and then others, um, contributors in the 20th century, you know, Ed Wilson, um, but also mm. um, uh, Richard Alexander, uh, the mm. biology of moral systems, um, right. various yeah. uh, trivers, you know, kin selection, those he didn't really, because he didn't understand inheritance or nobody did at that time, um, how he might have felt That's about true. that. And that might have um, moved things along and yet at the same time have those pe those lines of inquiry actually properly incorporated some of what Wallace had to say. Um, maybe not. Yeah, he, um, it's true, Kitty, he, how he, um, he really died kind of at the dawn of very early um, genetic understanding. I mean, Mendelism had been discovered, but it wasn't fully understood yet and still thought to be um, kind of fundamentally maybe support um, and, and um, a different kind of evolutionary mechanism, um, which, which, you know, not a Darwinian Wallacean mechanism. Um, and and certainly these these really exciting ideas in the 20th century of um, of inclusive fitness and kin selection, um, you know, way way after Wallace's time would be interesting to consider how we would have processed that. But he was very even to the end, kind of abreast on these latest developments, like you know August um, Weissman um, and the, the the discover of the kind of germ plasm theory and the separation of of um, kind of the germ cells from the rest of the body cells, Wallace immediately recognized the significance of that and championed um, Weissman's work um, uh, when it was translated into uh, in, into English. Um, and that's that work is of course considered to be pretty foundational in the in the history of uh, of genetics, also. And another thing I want to ask you um, if for this audience, because we're about to embark on 
a, bi a bio blitz and looking at biodiversity using the iNaturalist app. And, um, and it seems in a sense to me, there's still a gulf between the collectors and observers and um, being able to regard the big picture. And, um, you know, um, anyway, uh, um, how do you think Darwin, how do you think um, Wallace would have um, engaged with um, the internet and the collection of data by um, um, apps or, or like organizations like iNaturalist? Oh yeah, I, I I bet he he'd have iNaturalist, you know for <laughs> for sure. Um, I think that w Wallace is one of these people that that can really appreciate like the minutia, like the the fine details of the nuances of variation and the fine shades of difference between a couple of varieties of butterfly, but then also be able to see really big picture, like you know big big patterns of relationship and and those sorts of things. I think he reveled in in both of those, um, and he's was was really a. a sort of a natural historian there at, at Hard. And in 1908, when Wallace um, was asked to give an address at the Linnaean Society, kind of celebrating the 50th anniversary of the reading of, of his paper and Darwin's papers, um, and he was asked, you know, well, what, you know, what explains how you and Darwin came up with these ideas? And, and interestingly, um, you know, he laid the greatest stress on the idea that they were both beetle collectors. <laughs> that says something, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, you got, I you got you one question up. in the chat, Katie. Oh yeah. Oh please, yes. Okay. Um, yes, I, I can read it here. Yes, please. Uh, it was. Well, what I'm going to say. You do. Thanks so much. Just one second, sorry. And then I have a, a one question after that, if we, if we have time. Why? Here's the question from chat. Why are Wallace's contributions less well known today compared to Darwin's? Hmm. And there's a note saying, thank you for helping to remediate that situation. You're welcome. Thank you for that. The question, um, yeah, you know, um, I've thought a lot and speculated a lot about, you know, why is Wallace so much, you know, so so um, less well known than, than Darwin? And, and actually, in that um, 2014 book, Wallace, Darwin, and the Origin of Species, I'd really tried to tackle that, and I, I made an argument um, based on the idea that it's not that Wallace was was wronged, you know, or sidelined or something. Um, in some ways, he was his own worst enemy in this regard, in that, you know, it's Wallace's generosity of spirit, Wallace's magnanimity, that he always, from the very beginning with his relationship with Darwin, he he really genuinely admired Darwin's accomplishment, you know, his, his insight into um, evolution by natural selection and origin of species. So for years and years and years, he was he would always defer to his friend. He would he would never seek the limelight or try to take credit. Um, and then he seemed to compound that when he he published his own um, statement of, of 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 the you know the state of evolution as he saw it. Uh, in 1889, he titled the book Darwinism. You know, so again, he's reinforcing this idea that these are ideas are all Darwin's. You know, that they're, they don't belong to him. Also, but then at other times, he sort of he seems to like in that last unrealized book that I mentioned, he seems to um, twice mention his own independent discovery. And I, he may have been thinking very late in life that it might be nice if people remembered, you know, that he did, you know, some things too. Um, I, I think part of the process of, of eclipsing someone too has to do with the fact that the Darwin name was already a famous name. Um, even, you know, well before natural selection was, was discovered, um, Charles Darwin's gr um, grandfathers on both sides were famous in their day. Um, his his paternal grandfather, a best-selling um, uh, poet and and very well-regarded doctor, 
Um, I think that the name is already out there. And then Darwin's Voyage of the Beagle, very rightly, was a bestseller. I mean, that was a famous book, even in its own day. It was, it was well regarded. So you can kind of see the dynamic where the name is already out there. Um, Darwin is not, you know, maybe understandably not going out of his way to share credit. And Wallace is constantly deferring to Darwin. And so he kind of, he doesn't do himself any favors. Um, and then when Darwinism in general seems to kind of go into this so-called eclipse period in the early 20th century, when it emerges, Darwin's name emerges and Wallace is a sort of forgotten in the rediscovery of Darwin's, um, the, the, the Darwinian ideas. And that's kind of, in a nutshell, the, the analysis that I present in, the, in, that, in that book from 2014. Thank you. Sure. Thank you so much, um, Jim. And um, no. I'm, I really appreciate your interacting with us for such a long time. And um, wish you have a, a really good um, day tomorrow. And uh, we will uh, continue. We will finish off um, by ourselves. But um, thank you so much. I'll look forward to putting together um, some some more links you've shared some and I'll send them out to everybody sure. in a post um, email a post email.